We're going to hear now from Dr. Kusak, who's a cardiologist locally. Hi. Um, I am a cardiologist, and I've actually put in pacemakers in 92-year-old people because if you don't, their heart stops. <laughs> and, you know, you're left with the decision. Do you, do you do this procedure or not do this procedure, or do you let this person die? So it's not as so simple. I mean, it's sort of a buzz. A 92-year-old person gets a pacemaker. But, so if you struck a chord, and unfortunately you struck a lot of chords that have been concerning me um, over the past couple of years. And your prognostications have been eerily correct. Um, eerily, what I say. It's about five years ago, really, you didn't see a lot of um, cardiologists becoming part of multi-specialty groups, hospital-based um, groups. And over the last four to five years, you've seen this, this um, phenomenon. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, now I can. So you can see this phenomenon. As a matter of fact, many of my colleagues, and our group in particular, has done just that. Uh, uh, reimbursement from Medicare. Now I'm going to be upfront with you. I'm a cardiologist. I see a tremendous amount of Medicare patients. I'm also one of the few physicians, or our group is one of the few physicians in Stanford that also see Medicaid patients. You're hard pressed to find physicians to see Medicaid patients, and not everyone on Medicaid is, you know, not worked forever. I mean, some people lose their jobs. Some people need to be on Medicaid, and we see a tremendous amount of Medicare because that's the population I see older people, um, heart problems. And so I've been seeing the change that has occurred in the Medicare reimbursement, um, declining reimbursement rates, and there's more control over what kind of testing, what kind of um, medications can be prescribed to Medicare patients. So there is a tightening control, um, and that's it's a very interesting trend and a very scary trend. What I know about the upcoming healthcare reform is abysmally small. I think that's most physicians don't know what's going to happen. My impression is is that it's going to be like an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, my fear is, is that the government is going to then rule the kind of care that I can give my patients. They're going to, I, right now I have to get pre-certifications and authorizations and a, a nurse or a uh, allied health care person on the other end makes a decision about whether or not you get an echo or a stress test or deserve uh, an MRI or what have you. Um, they're not sitting in front of the patient. They're not taking care. They just look at their check marks. Um, and that concerns me because um, with declining rates of um, reimbursement and the increasing cost of doing business, and I'll explain that in one second, and we're going to be constrained by the government. The gov it's going to be a government-run insurance policy because it's going to be covering more and more expansive. And it ex health care is tremendously expensive. I had to go on COBRA several years ago, and I had to pay um, over $17,000 a year for covering myself and my two sons. Um, so I know how much it costs to cover insurance. It's tremendously expensive, and I understand health care costs have been rising precipitously, and we've got to do something to, to, to rein those things in. I just don't know whether or not this is the right way to do it. And I'm going to explain something what has been happening in our practice, particularly. We used to be private. Uh, a private, small private um, group, about five physicians. About a year ago, um, we decided to become part of the Stanford Hospital, so Stanford Health Integrated Physicians, um, because Medicare was, uh, our, our rates of reimbursement were declining, and we then were mandated that we had to go electronic medical records, e prescribing, or else face hefty fines. And if, since our population of patients is largely, or a, a good percentage, Medicare, we needed to do this. So our cost of providing care is rising. We have a, we need, you need a tremendous amount of staff to go through all the records that you get, take, follow up on labs, follow up on stress testing, get all, it's a tremendous business. I mean, the average physician, I think, needs five uh, people to support them in there. That's, and we don't even have that in our group. We run very lean. I don't even know the percentage of overhead. It's upwards of 40 to 50 percent, correct? Somewhere around there? Uh, I mean, seriously, in other words, in, a, in order to run a practice, you think that, okay, you get paid $50 or whatever to see a patient. Well, more than half of that goes to the support staff and all the other uh, stuff that goes on. So then you get reimbursement declines and the constriction about how you're able to deliver care. You've probably all been told you're not allowed to have that medication because it's not covered then I have to find another medication or get call the insurance company and get pre-authorization because you've tried X, Y, and Z and you can't take this. So 
we went over to uh, Stanford Health uh, because A, it took the burden off of us for running this practice and also improved uh, reimbursements. That is what you were talking about, how a lot of these uh, groups are doing that. I've noticed a lot of my colleagues in other areas, in Fairfield, in Westchester, um, a lot of this is the trend in hopes of being able to run your practice and providing care. Now, we used to be this mom and pop shop who was able to see patients and you know, all, you know, we generated an income and, and people drew a salary. Now we're on something called a revenue value unit and that's what we, we work on. So we have to now have a productivity model. So how are we going to be able to become efficient, have all this overhead with all these electronic medical records? Well, it's become a volume business. You probably have seen that. The time you spend in front of your doctor is decreasing, and a lot of times you're looking at the top of their head as they put, busily put their information in an electronic medical record. Now, nothing is all bad. Electronic medical records are wonderful for the exchange of information, but we spend an enormous amount of time up, uh, maintaining them and making sure that they're accurate. So what I have seen in my practice is that there's more and more emphasis on volume. There is uh, more and more emphasis on technology. I don't know where this is going to go with the expansion of Medicare because Medicare, I do believe, is trying to control how we spend our money on taking care of you. And it's, it's very concerning to me. I don't know what to expect in the near future. I'm afraid because I loved being a physician. I don't love it as much anymore. My biggest joy is talking to my patients. It takes time to educate people, to make them understand why I want to do a certain test, why I want them to go on to medic a certain medication. There's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of information out there. The New York Times always says statins are bad for you, so I have to spend a lot of time telling my patients why I think they need to stay on this medication. Well, Medicare doesn't want me to spend a half an hour explaining to you why you need to be on a certain medication or why you want to have a certain test. They want you to be in and out of my office in probably 10 minutes. That's not possible, that's not practical, that's not good medicine. If you want better outcomes, you need to spend the time. And I don't know where it's going. And that's concerning to me. And when you talked about whether or not I would tell my um, sons to go into medicine, I'd have to tell you, I have a great pause about that. Um, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of worry about um, liability. Uh, I don't know where that's going on. I don't, I don't look in front of my patients and say, now, is this person going to sue me? I want them to be on board with me as, as, as side by side we make decisions together so they will, they will make decisions that are right for them. That's not where the model I see. And I think the problem with most physicians is that we don't know where this is going. We don't know how it's going to impact our ability to deliver good quality care to you. Um, we had talked earlier about the Canadian model. Some of us fear that that's where we're going, that access to care is going to be limited, that you know it's not going to be feasible economically to see the patients for the amount of reimbursement we get is because of the overhead and the, the cost of care. So are people going to go concierge, which is a new model that people have been um, implementing and you've probably seen, where you pay an enormous amount of money, $5,000 a year or something like that, and you get to get one-on-one -on -one, um, time with your doctor. It's the other possibility that you know we're going to go more towards a Canadian model or socialized medicine model. and. With that, are Americans willing to exchange what they have for that model? And also, we are coming up on the baby movers of, of age. How are we going to capitate um, medical care when we know that people are getting older in, in society? There's this huge aging baby boom population. How the heck are we going to decrease our care if people are getting older? And with at age comes more health care issues. So, I, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. I know it's an enormous problem, and I don't think most doctors are expecting to be quadrillionaires. We just want to be able to give our patients good care that, so we can sleep at night. We know that we want to care for our parents like this, and but also, too, be able to pay our mortgage and 
by the way, I send my children to public school as well. So you know, and I don't have a barge or yacht, you know, sitting in, in you know in the sound. So I, I think it's just about that. It's about wanting to also continue to love your practice. And we don't know where it's going. I think there's you, when you see a stack of papers here that just say pass this bill, and we'll explain it to you later. Oh. That scares the hell out of me. And. That's, what's, that's what I'm here for. And I'm so glad you came because you explained a lot of the things that I've been wondering about. I think there's some good parts of this bill. I'm not saying that there's not. But I also think there's some, a lot of things that are just being passed, shoved down our throats. Who is going to pay for all of this? Where is this coming from? You know, are taxes going to increase? You know, or, or are we going to limit coverage so so narrowly that you have to? Like, I know what happens now. People come in and there's this huge copay, so they have these high deductible plans. I'm like, well, if you want to get this echo, which I really believe you need, you're going to have to spend a thousand dollars. And people get creative about making ends meet. From you know, if this, if we're going to push this into a a different model, people will make figure it out. And what's probably going to happen is either we're going to fall back on the consumer, meaning the patients cost or it's going to fall back on the position. Somehow someone's going to pay. And that's my fear. And I think there's a lot of questions to be answered. And I don't think anybody has given us any any clear ideas. And this is the first time we've heard at least some elucidation of some of that. Thank you. Do Dr. Chen, you want to go next? Sure.